So I'm Emmanuel Ulmo, I'm uh, the director of IHES in France, uh, Institut des Hautes Études Scientifiques. And uh, before introducing our speaker, I would like to thank AXA for welcoming us uh, tonight. And I'm really honored that CEO Mark Pearson was able to join us in person. And thanks a lot. So I would also like to warmly thank the American friends of IHS and uh, for organizing this event tonight. And uh, special thanks to Rafael. And uh, for those of you who are attending an IHS event for the first time, allow me to say a few words about our institutions. So IHS is a research institute dedicated mainly to mathematics and uh, theoretical physics. And from the beginning, uh, the institute has been devoted to the international community of scholars with a small permanent faculty of out outstanding talent. So of one figure gives a good idea of IHS position in the academic landscape out of 10 mathematicians recruited as permanent professors, uh, seven have been awarded the first medal. So each year, we welcome an average of 200 visitors from all around the world for research visits. Uh, they come to the institution for the unique atmosphere of scientific emulation, curiosity, driven <coughs> discussion, and freedom of research. So genius belonging to no nation and IHS forms together with all the institutes of basic research in mathematics and theoretical physics, a worldwide chain of knowledge dedicated to the development of human understanding at its most complex. IHS has very strong links with the US. In fact, the founding director, uh, Leon Merchan, modeled the institute after the Institute for Advanced Study and developed strong scientific connection with its academic community. For example, Oppenheimer was a member of the Scientific Council of IHS uh, at the beginning for several years. And for over 50 years, IHS has remained close to its American friends and enjoyed many exchanges of scientists, all extremely fruitful, fruitful for uh, the development of scientific research in France and in the United States. Today, American remains from far the number one nationality host at IHS for research visits. Now, allow me to introduce a great American scientist, Dr. Robert Frey. And uh, so after 25 years in, uh, as an applied mathematician in industry, maybe after 15 years spent in quantitative finance, as managing director in some well-known hedge fund, yeah, he decided to retire in 2004 and embark in, on an academic career at Stony Brook. Uh, so his work focused on risk management, modeling the process of uh, managing complex and dynamic portfolios. And tonight, he will present his analysis of 175 years of market go-downs. And uh, then maybe Michael Douglas, chairman of Friends of IHS and a great physicist who also works in finance, will moderate some uh, questions and answer a small debate before we invite you to join us for a uh, refreshment at the reception. I will be happy to meet you and tell you more about IHS and Mike and Robert. Uh, again, my warmest thanks for joining us tonight. Thank you. Well, you know, I, I, I want to thank uh, IEGS for, uh, for inviting me and uh, saying some, you know, who, and for wildly exaggerating my capabilities, but I appreciate it. And uh, I also want to thank AXA for hosting the event tonight. Um, what I want to talk about is, uh, actually, I originally said 175 years, but I, I actually, it ended up being 180 years of market drawdowns. And, um, you know, I think the process of drawdowns, I, th I think there's, there's really several points I want to make tonight. One is that, you know, when we look at financial markets, we have a tendency to be very myopic in our, in our focus. We, you know, we, we calibrate our models over, you know, short periods of time. We, we estimate risks based on, you know, what's happened over the last five or ten years. 
and we think that's a long-term you know, view of things. But in fact, you know, uh, financial markets o evolve and change over time scales that are probably lo much longer than a human lifetime. So you have to look over as long a period as possible to really gain insight. Now again, the, the argument often is, is that, well, that's, you know, that's sort of irrelevant, that you know, we're, we're dealing with, you know, if you're looking at the, you know, the 1800s, you didn't have a central bank, really, not really, you didn't really have a central bank. You had, uh, the, that was pre, you know, the early, you know, when, when I start here, it's really pre-industrial revolution. Um, now we're looking at the modern age, it's, uh, you know, we have high, high, high frequency trading, we have central bank, we have all sorts of interventions in the market. But I'm going to show here that at least in one important measure, the market hasn't changed much in those 180 years. And it's a measure that's, uh, I think, very relevant from a, from a risk point of view. It's, it's looking at, you know, a, a maximum drawdown. Okay. Right. So just, a, I, I don't know, just a quick bio. Uh, I worked as a, where I started as a scientist in the defense industry. I worked as a systems engineer and a program manager. Um, got my, my PhD in applied mathematics at Stony Brook University. And I was recruited into Morgan Stanley's uh, automated, uh, their, their past trading group in, in the, in the mid-'80s. Um, when that was, that looked like it was a little shaky. I, I started my own firm in 1989, uh, and I was recruited, uh, I, that, that was uh, acquired by Kepler, uh, uh, by Renaissance. Uh, that, that firm, Kepler, was acquired by Renaissance in 1992 because uh, I had started Kepler in, uh, uh, as, I was a partner with Jim Simons, and, and, and then Jim, uh, suggested that we, we merge the firms in 1992. It was one of the best uh, things I ever did. Um, I was a managing director with Renaissance. I developed the Nova and Equimetric funds, which were basically, Nova was essentially a stat-off fund, and Equimetrics was a, a longer-term analysis fund. Um, uh, and then, you know, I retired from, uh, from, uh, from, uh, that, from Renaissance in 2004. Uh, I was the advisory board chair of the University of Chicago's uh, program on financial financial mathematics, and uh, I'm founder and, uh, and uh, well, founder and originally director, but now, now co-director because uh, we just hired Raphael Dute. He's going to be my boss now, so I'm very happy about that because I can get a little rest and he can take over uh, and, and I think bring the department to new heights. I'm really fortunate. We're, I think we're very fortunate to have him. Um, and uh, I, also, I also run a, a fund of hedge funds. Uh, FQS Capital Investment, which is really an outgrowth of my family office. And as a lot of these things go, I was managing money, and other people asked me to manage money for them, and suddenly we had a, we had a company. So, yeah. um, I want to talk a little about sort of myopia. And, uh, you know, too often in finance and, and, and in life in general, day to day details overwhelm, uh, overwhelm us, narrowing our focus. And what I, what I have here is a, sort of a little, a little graph, and what, this was from a blog post I had put up. And what, I, what it was, was it was a regime, it was a looking at a regime shifting model of the uh, S&P 500. And I chose the period uh, 1985 to uh, 2000, this was at the time 2013, because that was sort of the extent of my, of my career at the time. You know, I started in about the mid 80s and went until, you know, to, 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 this was done in 2013. And what you can see is leading up to the 2008 crash, you can see that there was a period of, 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 of unusually low volatility. Now, what happens? You know, during periods such as this, obviously people think things are, you know, very steady and calm. Right? We also are dealing with, you know, perhaps an environment where returns tend to be sort of moderate and that sort of thing. But since things are so steady and calm and all the risks are low, what do we do? We, we leverage up like crazy in order to get higher levels of return. So just as, you know, Hyman Minsky pre predicted, you know, it's a sort of standard Minsky and sort of uh, condition, what, you know, the market becomes so levered and so, uh, you know, st unstable that it doesn't, that any little thing then becomes, it becomes a disaster and the whole market collapses. And you see in 2008, you know, we saw this, you see these marked increases in, in, in volatility. But, you know, now the, the, the trouble is, is that for many people, their whole career existed in that little valley that we, that we see, you know, sort of, uh, you sort of see, I wish I had a laser pointer. Is there a laser pointer? So you see here, that's almost a seven or eight year period. There were a lot of people, their whole careers were spent in this low, low volatility regime. And, you know, you, know, you know, and if you had taken the time to go back and look in markets over a longer period of time, and again, I, I mean, I just chose this period. This isn't, this isn't even enough time because it excludes things like the uh, like, like the, the Great Depression and many other things, but you know you can see here that you know this 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 sort of low volatility period here 
you know, obviously it was followed by, you know, much more erratic conditions here, but preceding it were, were, was a much higher level of sustained volatility, plus these sort of volatility jumps here, and then there was another period of low volatility, and again, you know, there was this, the, there was a peak here. So, you know, on the one hand, people, people are calibrating Gartz models and doing all kinds of crazy things. It's ridiculous. I mean, you know, they're saying that, you know, we're back to a new normal and everything's, nothing's going to change again. We're, even a moderate historical perspective would have shown that this was a ridiculous idea, right? I mean, we don't do it. We, we, we tend to look at these very short time periods. We tend not to be, we, not, we tend to be inadequate historians. We get too hung up with the mathematics and, and, and we should be better historians, okay? Um, and, you know, that's sort of the last comment here. You don't design a house based on the weather report, right? And, and that's what many people do with their portfolios. They, they, look at the, they, they look at tomorrow's weather forecast and build the house based on what they're going to see. And, that's not, and that, that's not a very sound way to do anything in life. Okay. okay. So let's talk about market drawdowns. Um, now, you know, a, an investment drawdown is a, the drawdown behavior of a particular investment is an important element in, uh, in its behavior. Um, what we're going to focus on is a, a single market, the S&P 500 total return. And total return meaning uh, any any dividends reinvested in the index. And we're going to look at the period from 1835 to uh, 2015. And the source for this is global financial data. And they have a sort of a pseudo 2000 uh, S&P 500 for, for early periods. Okay. So you know there's some important questions. You know how can drawdowns be modeled and analyzed? You know how do we sort of look at these drawdowns? You know how stable is this aspect of performance over time? And then, really, what insights can we develop examining the drawdowns in an important market over an extended period of time? And those are really the three issues I want to, I want to address here. And I, you know, what I've tried to do, I know we have a sort of a mixed audience, so I tried to be, I tried not to avoid technical issues, but I really wanted to focus on mainly the insights that you can gain from, from looking at this, looking at the, at the world, you know, from this perspective. So let's talk about cumulative log returns. So, you know, we're going to, you know, if I, if I look at the, 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 uh, the, the, the log of the, ch of, of the ratio of wealth from one period to the next, right, uh, that, that's, that's going to be, uh, that's my log return. So my cumulative log return is, this, is the cumulative sum going over, out over time. So that's, that's my basic measure. I'm going to look at the cumulative log returns. Now, I want to then define my, my a drawdown state. Now, what a drawdown state is, what I'm simply going to do is, I'm going to, just as I have a cumulative return, I'm going to have a running maximum. So at any point in time, as I go along the, the cumulative returns, I'm going to, I'm going to record the, the maximum value. And obviously, if, the, if, if I go through a losing period, that maximum value doesn't change. It just flattens out, right? And so what I do is I, 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 get, a, 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 I, I get that maximum value. Now, the difference between that running maximum and the current cumulative return is the drawdown. So it's fairly simple. Right? So now what I have is I have okay. So so now what I can do is what I have is I have these I have these these separate epochs, these separate periods, and what what I have is I can I can when I look at the, the, this drawdown number because I'm, I'm I, I don't care when when I'm doing better than 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 as I continue to hit new highs I I don't care about that that's that's just going to be zero is from the drawdown perspective. So in a drawdown state, the way I've sort of defined it, I'm going to I'm going to well, I'm going to have either a period where I'm in this drawdown state, so I'm going to have a continuous period of drawdown observations that are non that are non-zero, and that's going to be interspersed with periods where all of the observations are going to be zero, which represent periods where the market is rising, right? So that's I, I'm going to use that fact to partition the my drawdown, the drawdown states across time into, into partitions. And then, I'm just, and then the drawdown process I'm going to study is I'm going to simply take each, each subpartition and I'm going to look at the maximum drawdown that occurs in each partition and I'm going to look at the duration of time over, over which that drawdown occurred. And so I have a sequence of observations now which characterize the, what I call the drawdown process for, 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 the, uh, for, for, the, for the particular investment. Right? So it's a fairly simple idea. So this is. Uh, the partition is arbitrary. No, it's not arbitrary. It's based on the actual behavior. So, right. it, it, yeah. So if it, it's a contiguous, if there, the partition is contiguous segments where you're either in a drawdown state or not in a drawdown state. So it's the, the partitions 